So what do you think? Uh, have you looked over the paper? Uh, which one? Nemus. Nemus? New paper. Yeah, I was looking through it. It's interesting. Um, what so, caught your eye? I mean, he's really studying this bi-adjoint uh, scalar theory. So it turns out there's this whole double copy formalism. Yeah. And so you can take Yang-Mills, which describes um, you know, the strong force, the weak force, and electromagnetism. And uh, you can double copy that to gravity. Yeah. But it turns out that there's actually this other theory underneath Yang Mills. Yeah. So he's saying that the associahedra are describing that theory. And this okay. theory is very simple. And it turns out that it's like two layers below gravity. So it appears that by studying this simpler theory, that somehow relates to the associahedra yeah. and describing um, sort of an amplitude hedron of that theory. So then you could calculate the amplitude hedra in that theory and then do these like it's still, you know, we still need to figure all these details out, but yeah. it seems like they might be possible to take those answers and then you could do like one transformation to get all these Yang Mills stuff, yeah. and then you could do another transformation there to get all the gravity stuff. And Yang Mills and gravity is like all the physics we know. Right. I mean, electromagnetism yeah. is a little simpler than Yang Mills, but. That sounds good. So, what about the talk uh, that you just came out from? So that was actually looking at the biadjoint scalar theory, but that, studying was classical that, solutions of gravitational radiation. Okay. So um, they figured out the lowest order replacement rules to find classical Yang-Mills radiation and classical gravitational radiation. Right. So let's walk this way. Okay. So. There's this very bizarre, weird biadjoint scalar theory that doesn't seem to be like in our universe in any way, but it's just this mathematical theory that seems to underlie all of the other theories that we know. So if we study this simpler theory, it seems like we can actually calculate things efficiently there and okay. then just bring it out. And that's where the associahedra are living is what Nima recently said. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because the reason we can see this is uh, originally, you, 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 you were the one that introduced Associahedra to me, I think a year ago. Yeah. And um, I, probably... I, didn't, I had never even heard of them, but I had been studying uh, the strong force and looking at scattering amplitudes. Yeah. And it turns out that, um, you know, you can break down these amplitudes into like a color part yeah. and a kinematics part. And exactly. when you look at the color part, um, I instantly noticed that the isosahedra were relating to the quark color decomposition yeah. of that, what's going on there. So, and that's exactly what this biadjoint theory is looking at because okay. it, it has like two colors. So oh, then there's like this weird theory that has like two different colors. Okay. Then you can take that color and do this transformation and then you bring the color to momentum. Okay. So there's this like color kinematics right. duality. It's a, it's a, yeah. And then I have one color charge and one momentum as being a source for a Yang Mills field for mm. the strong force. So um, yeah, that's all in there. And then if I take that color charge and turn it into another momentum factor, yeah. then I get a source for gravitational radiation. Okay. So at this point, if this duality exists, uh, and I think they claimed it was a diffeomorphism of some sort, right, in the paper? Yeah. But I, a diffeomorphism yeah. of, of some larger object, perhaps. Maybe there's some larger object that contains this mapping as an automorphism. It's a, it's a symmetry of itself. Hmm. Okay, so if we have an object like that, I think uh, that's, that would be <clears throat> more along the lines of what Garrett has in mind. Garrett Lisi uh, okay. and uh, their interest in these unified structures like E8. So I, I think there could be uh, another test bed there with the E8 formalism in which color kinematics duality can perhaps be expressed as a symmetry of that structure. Yes, I mean, what's interesting about what Garrett's doing is that conventionally this color kinematics duality isn't really ever putting the Yang-Mills stuff and the gravity together. 
but it's just doing a mapping between these yeah. two theories. But what Garrett is trying to actually obtain is one theory with both of these things in it. So it seems like he's trying to build this larger theory that has this innate color kinematics duality right. built yeah. in, right? So it's, it's more ambitious in that sense. Yes. But, you know, I mean, at the end of the day that, you know, we, we have to add up all the forces, you know, it's, right. it's, it's not that radical at all in that sense. So it seems pretty promising for that reason. Yeah, it does. Well, the isosahedra, um, that's, that's typically uh, considered a combinatorial, combinatorial object that arises in category theory. So it relates to more general structures like operats and uh, categorical objects like monads. So okay. that can be exploited as well. So with Nima's let's, paper... Let's go this way. There's a sculpture garden. So with... Uh, if we extend it in this larger framework, uh, there's uh, this concept of an operad. Okay, so okay. an operad, you can think of it, okay, as uh, some means. Okay, you have different operations, n area operations on this object, right? So you can have an operad over little disks. Okay, and you know, okay. disks come up frequently when you're computing uh, yeah. objects in physics, right? So we can imagine an operad of little disks. We can have an operad, say, of uh, Riemann spheres. Spheres, tori. Right? And the Riemann spheres, in turn, would relate to the moduli space of marked Riemann spheres, right? That, that has come up with world sheet right. studies, so. And it seems like a lot of the, well, most people are really focused on these Riemann spheres a lot. That's yes. where a lot of the development is happening. Yeah. But it's, it's not actually that crazy to just study something a little bit more exotic involving no. Carton geometry. And it's really, right. I think you're going to really actually need it in order to properly describe um, intrinsic spin of quantum particles. So, um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we can, we can say that this Carton geometry isn't physical. And in some sense, that is true because it, it gives you torsion and it doesn't seem like Einstein Carton theory has propagating torsion, but it still produces this matter matter interaction. So, um, and it's difficult to calculate this stuff. So a lot of people tend to try to ignore that, those interactions. Yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, like you're gonna, I mean, if you're gonna scatter matter and study all of its gravitational interactions, I mean, you're gonna need to pick up that interaction, whether you study it in the context of Einstein Carton geometry or just add it in by hand, it doesn't matter, you'll get the same answer. But I mean, it seems that going from Riemann geometry to Carton geometry um, essentially gives you that for free. Yeah, and there's also, <clears throat> there's also the issue of integrating in this perspective of non-commutative geometry that comes up. So that's where operator algebras come in. Yeah. But what's nice about operator algebras is that in the case of, say, Jordan algebras, where you have self adjoint, you have algebras of self adjoint operators, we can actually look at the rank one objects in that algebra and perceive them as a projective space. And projective spaces are very nice because in the complex case, we have unitary symmetries as the, as the symmetries of these projective spaces. So that's very familiar from the perspective Physicists of quantum love mechanics. Unitary groups, they're exactly. how everything transforms. So these would be interpreted as in quantum mechanics as pure state spaces. Right. So I mean, I think what you're basically saying is that classically, um, space time is commutative, just as Riemann geometry is commutative geometry. And uh, however, we know that at the quantum mechanical level, the notion of space time needs needs to break down. It it's, it seems like it's ill defined. So. Right. Um, it seems like there should be some reformulation that has space-time emergent from some other more abstract geometry, which right, is, I think what this non, non community of geometry is getting at, right? So right. Um, it's, it's really interesting to study because you can study this and then actually kind of take a classical limit and then you're going to reproduce all of Einstein's theories. So it, it's very natural in that sense.
Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a taking the approach of Heisenberg <laughs> or taking the approach of Einstein yeah, as, as more fundamental, which one, right? So you can think, well, Heisenberg uh, was interested in matrix quantum mechanics. So this is the operator formalism is more along those lines. Right. So what happens if you take the operator theory as fundamental and produce a limit in which that geometry based on non-commutative operator algebras becomes commutative. Right. Which hopefully would would give uh, general relativity or something like right. general relativity. I, I mean, I think, you know, at the end of the day, when you're going to study some observation at some macroscopic level, you know, making that observation at the end of the day, it's going to it's going to make everything smooth. You know, like right. large observables are like making a large observation, a macroscopic observation is going to, you're going to see that community of geometry, but at right. the quantum level, things could be more complicated. Yeah, you can have And uh, I mean, and that's kind of the point why a lot of people say you can't naively quantize uh, general relativity because um, the fabric of space time needs to be quantized itself, but in, you know, the standard model, all the other forces, you, you don't really need to do that. You assume space-time from the beginning, but then you're quantizing these other fields. Right. So it seems possible to reformulate all of quantum field theory. Yeah. And then if you do that, then maybe we can put gravity and all the forces together to get some sort of unified model. And what's also nice is that the concept of D-brain came about in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. Right, and they've discovered that the natural coordinates for D-brains are non-commutative. <laughs> so it's almost as if this D-brain geometry inherently encodes non-commutative geometry. And they figured out how to relate it to uh, the dirac born infeld formalism, which you know a little bit about. That's basically a high energy version of Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations break down at high energies and classically you need to replace this with a born infeld theory. Yes. So it could be that this D-brain formalism is quite handy. And uh, it would be nice also. Well, this, the symmetries uh, that arise uh, along world volumes of coincident D-brains um, also produce unitary symmetries as well. <laughs> so it's pretty convenient there. Wow, yeah. So it seems that as if the pieces are on the table scattered. It's really and funny. they need to be pieced together. It's really funny because there's all these different researchers all over the place yeah. and everyone has different names for things, but it seems like secretly they're all kind of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, I've seen these arguments on the internet, uh, people studying Einstein-Carton theory, and they're kind of attacking string theory, string theory, like there's this argument, but it seems like they might be talking about the same thing. They're, I mean, I, I don't study string theory in great detail, but I mean, they talk about compactifying on yes. these tori, I don't, like it's unclear to me, you know, is it a particle? Well, they have strings. Well, maybe you can't have strings, so let's introduce these brains. Right. Right. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I heard from a colleague that um, he was trying to make a model where he was interpreting these brains as little tori, and I was like, wait, oh. what is that? Are you yeah. saying that's the same thing? I <laughs> so it's interesting to see how all these different things could. I mean, yeah, the tori. Some theory uh, should make sense, you know. Yeah, and also. Uh, for tori, uh, you can think of, well, for the heterotic string, you can imagine uh, there being a tori in there as well, right, which is uh, the 16 dimensional torus. Uh, and what, what symmetry is behind the heterotic string? The E8, E8, so it's like two oh, copies of E8, yeah. <laughs> so that's already naturally coming about. So there's these hints, so it's not really in total conflict uh, right. with, say, uh, Garrett's theory, but he would just have one copy of V8. This is much richer, and uh, I've been working on this new structure called exceptional periodicity, where you can actually see multiple copies of V8. Hmm. And uh, so, like E8, and then E8 cross E8, and then so that would be like kind of naively, yes. But uh, these algebras are much richer, so it's much like uh, the concept of bot periodicity. So it's okay, this periodic. That? So it's, these, uh, it's this periodic um, pattern within the rotational groups. Okay, so you have uh, rotations in n dimensions. Okay. And you can see this periodic pattern every eight dimensions. Right, so, so you this, could study something in one dimension in nine dimensions, and 
they're secretly the related. yeah you can you can go in between as well obviously yeah. so this exceptional periodicity is a way to extend the symmetries that we see in the exceptional Lie algebras because you know we have this classification of uh, fin or finite dimensional Lie algebras so we have a an A, B, C, D. We have these A, B, C, D families. But then you have this exceptional family, <laughs> and it terminates at E8. So the question group. is, why, why is that Why does it case? end? Yeah, why does it end? Why can't we just why are they have... Why special? Why can't we just have a little more fun?